this just happened to me recently. Um, I think for those of us based in Alberta, even across Canada, uh, a lot of the public health measures are starting to relax. Um, and so I've been heading back into my office uh, just once a week for the last couple of weeks to try to get back into a bit of a routine before we're uh, having to go back full time. Well, in doing so, I just thought I would maybe take care of some chores that I've been neglecting uh, from having worked from home. And part of that was go to the bank and um, deposit bills that I had just kicking around because who carries cash nowadays anyways? So I go to the ATM, which I haven't, something I haven't done in the last two years. And I look around for an envelope because that's what usually you would do. Couldn't find an envelope. So I thought, oh, well, maybe they had forgot to restock it. But then it dawned on me that actually the entire kiosk where the ATM is located didn't even have slots for envelopes. So I looked carefully at the machine and it said, oh, for a deposit, you just stick your bills right into the slot. And so this was a little bit of a foreign concept to me. So you can imagine I'm just standing there recounting my bills, making sure that I had the right amount. Um, and then reluctantly, I stick the bills into the slot there. Um, well, and then sure enough, uh, the machine probably utilizes some form of artificial intelligence, computer vision, counts up the bills and says, you have just deposited this much. Sure enough, there was the amount that I had counted. And then the transaction was done. As I was walking away, it had me thinking about something that not too long ago, there was probably someone on the other side of that machine, maybe not literally, but someone would have taken that envelope that had my bills or my checks in it, had to open it up, had to count it. And knowing that it's a bank, it probably has compensating control. So maybe there would be someone else that would do an, another va uh, validation of the counting before the transaction was actually posted. Now we're at a state where that entire role is gone. So where there was once some workflow to uh, enable this transaction to happen, that's now been automated. And hopefully, uh, maybe it's one of these tellers that was doing it, they're now freed up to do something that's more value add for the bank. Um, so it really had me thinking about, wow, you know, like a lot of companies now, including my own, um, are going through these digital transformations. And you hear all the time that one of the benefits of transformation is realizing more value without increasing costs. And so this was just a very tangible example to me of how digital transformation is occurring. And so why I share this as a safety moment is because many that are part of the untapped energy community uh, may be in various states of their professional career. Um, they may still be in the energy sector, but are possibly thinking of how it is that maybe they position themselves out of it. Uh, or having gone through some digital transformation, you're starting to realize that being data literate, literate and having skills in data science is actually quite valuable for where the company is headed. And so as you contemplate these things, and especially as you listen to uh, what Yogi is about to share with us, um, Give some thought to where is your trajectory heading? Is the role that you're in today one day going to be replaced by AI or computer vision? And there's probably a good chance that it may be. How can you now give some thought to where you could position yourself so that you still remain relevant, even in a state of digitally transformed? Uh, Yogi Schultz is no stranger to the untapped energy community. Um, he's a longtime supporter of this group, has presented here many times, and always has uh, something very interesting uh, to share with all of us. So he's with Corvell Consulting, uh, actually has a very storied history working in Calgary Oil and Gas in so many different um, applications, from advising to management to the implementation of information systems. So he knows a thing or two about streamlining workflow. Um, and so he's gonna to speak to us today about positioning your AI project um, in such a way that it would be, it's not a better chance of getting uh, received. Thank you, Tim and Mark for inviting me to deliver this presentation, the untapped energy community. In this presentation, we'll discuss how to sell your AI ML derived recommendations. I have observed too often that data science teams perform great project work and then crash and burn on the goal line by failing to appropriately describe their work and sell their recommendations. Too often the work of data science teams makes senior executives really nervous. 
Most senior executives who are members of the project steering committee are painfully aware that they have little or no expertise in this area. So what I wanna do is have you think about how to focus your presentation to align with your audience's perspective to successfully sell your AI ML derived recommendations. Hey, we're information technology related management consulting organizations. We've uh, executed many project management systems development assignments in our oil and gas clients. I write a regular column in IT Canada, and you'll see that this presentation is derived from some of those columns. So you can read all about it there if that would be valuable to you. So let's talk about reading your boss. Who will be in the conference room when you're presenting your recommendations? Who needs to build confidence in those recommendations? The audience always consists of more senior executives in your organization. Everyone will be more senior than you. The reality is that AI ML technology is entirely outside their experience domain. Successful ex executives understand the importance of always looking in control and not inadvertently asking naive or stupid questions. This skill is vital to maintaining their carefully burnished reputations. So here are three potential characters that will be in the conference room when you're presenting your recommendations. So few bosses will openly reveal their skepticism or their lack of understanding of what you're presenting like this guy. Most bosses are too experienced, too polished to reveal their skepticism or their lack of understanding. Most likely your boss will become quiet and in introspective when they're skeptical or downright insecure because they don't have the background to understand what you're saying. A few bosses will have the confidence to be openly skeptical even when they really don't understand what you're talking about. So given that you'll face these talent challenging dynamics, how should you present your work as the leader of the team dominated by data scientists? My recommendation is that you focus on describing the business value that can be derived from your work. Describe your project approach to the problem space only at a very high level, very conceptual level. Ignore all the technical details, even though you've been immersed in that for months and are proud of the technical work that your team has accomplished, and you probably should be. This presentation approach is not easy for most data scientists. It requires quite an adjustment, and that's why we're here today. So be prepared to answer the questions that we'll spend our time discussing today. Our innovative Justify It feature uses an AI ML model to find results that agree with your point of view. Uh, I don't think so. Presenting results to management in a positive light is always an excellent strategy. Twisting your results to align with previously determined direction or a desired outcome is unethical. So here's the outline of our presentation today. We'll start with a brief discussion of the goal of your presentation to management. The goal is to briefly describe your project work and then sell your recommendation. The, the list of topics and questions are valuable at various times in the project. If you're pitching the project, have you got it all covered? When you're scoping and planning the project, have you got tasks that relate to all of this? And when, and of course, when you're selling your recommendations, it's these non-technical questions that I think will come to mind for management. It's pretty hard to predict which ones will come to the mind of which manager on which project, but some of these are going to come up. So you might as well be prepared and have a comprehensive answer. So what questions must you be ready to answer to build your boss's confidence in your work? There are many questions that could pop up. The questions that management may ask will fit into these broad categories. And they are the accuracy of the business opportunity, the data you're using, the adequacy of your algorithm, the adequacy of your model, the congruity between the data and the model, and how your work advances the corporate strategy and the, how to understand the data elements that are involved in your work, the adequacy of the team competencies and the attention to responsible AI and the explainability of your results. So today we'll touch on multiple questions for each of these topics briefly. As you work on your project and as you prepare your recommendations for your boss on the steering committee, 
you'll want to make sure you can answer these questions. Focus on the questions that are more important and relevant to your project. You'll never have to answer all of the questions I wanna share with you today. So how will your answers be evaluated? The way you answer the questions will either add confidence that your recommendations make sense or your answers will reduce confidence. Often confidence building is unrelated to the content of your answer. So what's your goal as you present your findings and your recommendation? It's never your goal to crash and burn in front of senior executives. Your goal is always to have your recommendations accepted. Typically, your recommendations include the following, more money to elaborate or confirm your findings, money for implementation, money to upgrade the solution. So what's the common theme here? Not a difficult question. It's always about the money. Your presentation goal should never be explaining the cool technology you use to build your model or analyze the data, even though that's a great story. Beating your chest to show off the advanced algorithms you employed, even though you're proud of that work. Reminding everyone that your team worked incredibly hard on the project, even though that's true. So don't go there. To avoid crashing and burning, focus on the business opportunity and the benefits and not the technology wizardry. Recognize your, that your audience has almost no exposure to AI ML technology. That reality will make them nervous, insecure, and reluctant to adopt any recommendation. Make sure your presentation builds confidence, doesn't put anyone on the spot, doesn't bamboozle anyone, and doesn't intimidate anyone. So here's the first topic and the set of questions that goes with it. The accuracy of the business problem or opportunity statement. The confidence you can have in your recommendations is highly dependent on ensuring that the project team is attacking an accurate business problem or opportunity statement. So here are some related questions. Did you determine that the business problem opportunity statement that you used to achieve project approval was reasonably accurate? How did you determine that the AIML technology could deliver a credible or an appropriate solution for the business opportunity? How did your estimate of the tangible business benefits of the project evolve from project inception to now? How much did your project risk register change during the project? Now, I hope you noticed I've crafted these questions to be non-technical, so you can think about answering them in a non-technical way. Those answers will build confidence and understanding in your management team audience. Okay, data sufficiency. The confidence you can have in your recommendations is highly dependent on the data sufficiency found in the data sources used by your project team. By data sufficiency, I mean volume and variety of data. Data is likely the most critical element of all the AI ML system components that underlie your recommendations. Here are some related questions that will illuminate your actual data sufficiency. How did you determine, determine that the data sources were relevant to the business problem space? How, did you, how do we know that the data sources you employed are sufficient in number to support the model comprehensively? How did your subject matter experts determine that the training data for your model was rich enough or not to ensure the model accuracy? How did you raise your da training data quality and volume sufficiently to ensure that the error term associated with the model is small or modest? And that gets into the subject of uh, synthetic training data. How did you examine the training data for bias and then minimize that bias? So those are the questions I suspect someone will ask about data sufficiency. Now, what about data quality accuracy? The confidence you can have in the recommendations is highly dependent on the data quality found in the data sources. By data quality, I mean accuracy, which means no invalid or missing values, completeness, which means no nulls or missing rows. Again, data quality is a critical element in, of all the application components that underlie the reliability of your recommendations. So here are some related questions. How do we know that the quality of the data you employed is sufficient to support the model comprehensively. How deeply did you profile the data to assess its initial quality and identify the actions you undertook to improve data quality? Do you understand the provenance of the data adequately? 
How did you approach the metadata management to build assurance that the data elements in the data sources are adequate for a reliable model? Okay, so this is about machine learning. So there's an algorithm. How do you know it's adequate? So the algorithm is a procedure that reads the training data to create a machine learning model. The algorithm is available to build the models very widely in scope and complexity. The confidence you can have in the recommendation is highly dependent on the adequacy of these uh, algorithms. So here are some related questions. How did you determine which algorithms to use to build your model? Of the algorithms that produced your model, which ones did you use as is and which ones did you revise? How did you determine that the algorithms are of adequate quality and contain few software defects? If you identified multiple algorithms, did you test more than one and compare the results for degree of accuracy? So what about the model? How adequate is it? Is it? A machine learning model is the object that's saved after running the machine learning algorithm that's reading your training data. The model consists of the rules, numbers, and any other algorithm-specific data structures required to make predictions when the model uses real-world data in production use. Now, AI models, as you probably all know, vary widely in terms of scope and complexity. So again, the confidence you can have in your recommendation is dependent on the adequacy of the model. So here are some questions you should be thinking about. How do we know that the model is appropriate for the business situation that we're trying to model? How do we know that the model isn't subtly, subtly or worse, significantly modeling a different business situation that's inadvertently different from what we're trying to model? What effort did you make to recognize bias in your model? Have you documented and reviewed a list of assumptions embedded in the model? Did any of the model results surprise you either with, tra with the training data or the real world data? Did you research examples of similar AI ML applications and what did you find? Now, what about the congruity between the data and the model? Because they have to work together rather intimately. The selected data and its model must work together well. The confidence you can have is dependent on this congruity. So here are some questions. How do you know that the data is sufficiently comprehensive for the algorithms you're using to create the model? How did you engage your subject matter experts to weed out seemingly exciting correlations in the results that are coincidental and are therefore not valuable insights at all? How did you approach data and model governance to build assurance that the data quality is adequate and the model is reliable? Can you explain the variance in model results between using the training data on one hand and the real world data on the other? Can you explain the model results considering the data that you used? Were you able to compare model results using similar data from different data sources but cover the same data elements? What about corporate strategy? The goal of your project must advance some aspect of the corporate strategy. And, and if, if there's not an alignment there between the project and the corporate strategy, it, it begs the question of why you're doing the project. So here are some related questions that will illuminate this alignment. Please describe how you ensure that the model's goal is aligned with our business goals or pressing issues. Please describe how you ensured that the project goal advances an element of the published corporate strategy. Did the project team find itself debating what the published corporate strategy actually meant? And if there's a link to this project, do the recommendations suggest that some revisions to the corporate strategy should be considered? Okay. Could you elaborate on the risks, particularly reputational risks that the organization will face if we implement your recommendations. What is a straightforward way to communicate your recommendations and the associated risks to other of our organization leaders? Okay, understanding the data elements. Some data elements or features of your model are always more important to the results than others. The confidence that you can have in the recommendation is highly dependent on the project team having a good understanding of which data elements are most important. So here are some related questions that will illuminate this confidence. Which data elements are your algorithms most sensitive to? How did you ensure that the data quality for the most critical data elements is sufficient? 
How did you determine that similarly named data elements across your data sources are in fact identical or not to avoid misunderstanding the data meanings? So how, how similar or different are the data element definitions for your algorithms compared to equivalent data elements we use to report our operations performance? To what extent did you revise your algorithms as you gained more understanding about which data elements are the most important to your results? How did you avoid using data elements that appear to be quite different, but actually represent almost the same feature and thereby introduce bias into your model. So the adequacy of the team competencies. No project team ever has all the talent they'd like to have on board. Nevertheless, the confidence you can have in the recommendations depends on the adequacy of the team competencies. Here are some related questions that will help with this topic. Given the project characteristics, which technical competencies are adequately or inadequately represented on the project team? Considering the wide variety of data sources this project employed, how do we know that subject matter expertise for the various data sources was sufficient within the project? How much project team turnover occurred during the project? What technologies or data did you introduce during the project that required the addition of new competencies? So please describe the training you provided the team to boost competency during the project. And to what extent has the project relied on external consultants to round out team competencies? So what about the attention to responsible AI? Responsible AI is about ethics. Ethics is an awkward abstract topics. In, in their enthusiasm for the project work, the team often neglects this topic, even though they're not acting in some unethical way. If you become come to believe that the team is con consciously acting in an unethical way, it's time to fire people. The confidence you can have in the recommendations is dependent on the project team paying at least some attention to responsible AI. Here are some questions that will illuminate potential issues. If your data sources or data gathering involve data about individuals, how did the team ensure data privacy? How did you ensure that the data used for the project came from compliant and unbiased sources? What actions did the team take to mitigate the risk of bias in its work? While responsible AI is a rapidly evolving topic, what ethics principles did your team consider in its work? What is your recommended plan for monitoring the performance of the models? And Last but by no means least, the explainability of results. Explainable artificial intelligence is a set of processes and methods that allow human end users to comprehend and trust the results of AI ML models. So the confidence you can have in your recommendations is dependent on the project design, including explainability features. So here are some related questions. To what extent did the project design incorporate traceability? How would you characterize your model's accuracy, explainability, transparency, result of the, and transparency of the results? Have you conducted a fairness and bias assessment of model results? Have you performed a model risk assessment? Does the AI ML application you want to deploy trigger an alert when the model deviates from the expected results? What is your strategy for monitoring the application to ensure that it continues to deliver expected results? So that's the last of the 10 topics. I hope you heard some questions that if you answer them, they'll help you position your AIML project for better success. Now, what about the answers? Here's how your boss will evaluate your answers to the many questions we've just discussed. I hope you notice that management doesn't have to be an AIML wizard to ask any of the questions that we just listed. Evaluating your answers is not that difficult because your answers on behalf of the project team will almost always fit into one of these categories that I wanna share with you. The first one is called blank stares. If you provide blank stares, this means the topic of the question has not been addressed and requires more attention before the recommendation should be 
adopted. It may be necessary to add missing skills to your team or even replace part or all of your team. Another type of answer is called lengthy answers filled with lots of data science jargon. If you provided a lengthy list, lengthy answer filled with lots of jargon or techno chatter, the topic has not been addressed sufficiently or worse, your team may lack the critical skills required to deliver confident recommendations. Management's confidence in the recommendation should decrease or even disappear. Third answer is, our approach is the same as one of these hyperscale web giants. This response should decrease management's confidence because your problems are only rarely the same as theirs. Now, a better approach is something called thoughtful responses. If you provided a thoughtful response that pointed to uncertainties and risks associated with the recommendations, management's confidence in the work should increase. A thoughtful answer indicates the team has spent some time thinking about risks and the broader context of the project goal. So another answer could be response that describes potential unantic unanticipated sorry, consequences. If you provide a response that describes potential consequences, management's confidence in the recommendation should increase. An answer describing such consequences indicates that the team has conducted a risk assessment. Uh, responses that include business implications. If you provided a response that describes the business opportunity or implications of the results, management's confidence in the recommendation should increase. Management will know that the team is business focused, not just technology focused. Another one is if your answers are, are supported by additional slides. If the answer you provided are supported by additional slides with relevant figures and charts, management's confidence in the team should increase significantly. Extra slides means the team has tried to anticipate likely questions and concerns. Last one is that the project team acknowledges limitations or shortcomings. If the project team acknowledges that the topic of the question should receive more attention, perhaps with more data or more sophisticated algorithm, management's confidence in the team should increase. Candor is refreshing. It will probably be necessary to allocate more resources, such as data science consultants to remedy the shortfall. Now, the first three responses will cause management's confidence to decrease or even evaporate. Uh, focus on the last four types of responses because they will cause management's confidence to increase. The message here is that you need to be prepared for a wide range of questions and that the answers are for a business audience and not a technical audience. Talk about business risk, business implications, not technical risk. We're outsourcing all of our critical business decisions to a flawed AI ML model with dubious data. What could possibly go wrong with this idea? Now, cartoonists are good at ridiculous exaggeration, but don't oversell your results and don't wildly overstate expected benefits. I hope I've provided you with multiple ideas to, to avoid ending up in this predicament that's illustrated in this cartoon in your work. So some conclusions. Uh, AI ML projects must address many topics to deliver a high confidence set of recommendations. The questions that you can anticipate from your senior executives will fall into these 10 topics. The accuracy of the business opportunity, questions around the data, the algorithm adequacy, the model adequacy, issues around the congruity of the data and the model, how your project advances the corporate strategy, around how well you understand the data elements your model uses, the adequacy of the team competencies, and how much attention you paid to responsible AI, and are the results explainable or not? So responding ac accurately and confidently to the questions for the topics I've presented will cause your boss to accept your AI ML derived recommendations. That's how you achieve success as a project team. So what should you do with all of this? My recommendations to you are as follows. 
Focus on describing business value that can be derived from your work during your presentation. Ignore the technical details, even though you've been immersed in that for months and are proud of the technical work that's been accomplished. Answer the relevant questions I described in my presentation today during the course of your project to ensure that your project design has comprehensively addressed these questions and that your project recommendations are accepted and not subject to challenge due to a lack of management understanding or outright skepticism. Do not explicitly discuss any of these questions and your answers during your presentation to management. You'll just mire yourself and your audience in detail. You'll kill the confidence that you're trying to build. Answer only the questions that are raised by your boss. Try to anticipate some of the questions and prepare slides that illustrate your answers. Only show, show these slides if the re related question arises. When the audience See slides that are not part of your plan set that builds an enormous amount of confidence that you understand what you're doing and what you're about. Now, at the end of this presentation is a, a lengthy bibliography related to AI ML. And you're welcome to, uh, I guess it, it goes on and on and on. So anyway, and if you're interested in what I've written about this subject, uh, these are the articles that you can read by clicking on these links or going to the IT World Canada. Uh, so Jim would like to know, well, first he, he, he loves the blanks there comment. Have you ever seen this? And what do you do to get out of it? So describe that moment where you just realize, uh oh, <laughs> I, I'm getting the blank stare. If you're the presenter and you're giving the blank stare, uh, your, your credibility is evaporating or disappearing in real time. You better think of something. If you absolutely can't think of anything, you're gonna to need to say, thank you for that question. Uh, the team and I will get back to you in the next few days with a comprehensive response. I think I've seen many times when you're trying to BS your way through a response, it comes out very clearly and uh, it probably erodes even more um, credibility. If you think about the skills that senior managers have acquired over a significant career, it's certainly a, a BS sensor is right up there, right? So you don't want to do that. That, mm -hmm. that doesn't help you. Of all the concerns and showstoppers that leaders might have, which would you say is the most common or the most effective at stopping a project, Yogi? I think there's a couple of things. Sometimes our we overestimate the benefit. So, you know, so people are rolling their eyes. There's no way they can deliver that. So be careful about that. And if and if you if you truly believe you have a incredible benefit, make sure you can back that up with very solid factual analysis, very rigorous. The other topic that management is very concerned about is reputational risk. So how good is the risk assessment of what, what's being done here? Now, the other, the other issue that comes, if you're going to ask for truckloads of money, okay, then maybe you better have a strong story. But most of the AI projects I've run into, oh, you know, they're not scary in terms of the money they need. So that may be a lesser problem. Yeah, you know, that reputational risk is a very interesting risk that I think a lot of organizations will have to wrestle with as more and more of these type of machine learning and AI projects uh, start to, to become implemented. If there is bias in the data set that is training up the AI algorithm, then inadvertently that same bias may uh, show up in the way that uh, the application uh, occurs. What do you think might be one way that you as the project leader could give your leader some assurance that bias isn't going to be something that comes back and bites you. You need to say, here is what, what we did. Here's what the risks of bias that we observed. And here are the actions that we took to minimize or eliminate those biases within our model. 
Okay, as opposed to, yeah, we thought about it and we're comfortable. You know, that's pretty fluffy stuff. That wouldn't that wouldn't cut any ice. And and there are quite a number of techniques for addressing bias, and I think it's important to make sure you employ those techniques. Places like the EU and the OECD, you know, they have groups of people thinking about this stuff. Well, one of the other um, things you mentioned was explainable uh, ML, um, a growing topic. Um, and that could be something that maybe could help to uh, counter some of the risks that uh, bias in data might cause. Yeah. You know, being able to uh, clearly articulate what does the algorithm do. Um, I think supplementing this is also a growing interest in the ability to audit AI. So as more organizations are implementing machine learning algorithms into running their business operations and processes, uh, what are the auditors going to do? They also need to understand how it is that these algorithms are helping the company to generate value, but also the risks that come along with that. Uh, with what you're observing, um, how do you see explainable machine learning, so XML, playing a larger part in the way that these projects are being pitched to leadership? What I observe is that there are now, you mentioned the word audit. There are some pretty good audit procedures that are being developed that uh, I think can illuminate either weaknesses or confirm that the topic has been properly dealt with by the project team. So you can avail yourself of those. And again, there's a couple references to some frameworks for doing that in the bibliography to the presentation. The second answer is there's actually now pieces of specialized software that you can deploy to help you with the explainability. No, it, th those are great um, points to raise, um, Yogi, because I think on a lot of uh, board risk registers. Um, it's This is uh, something that's starting to appear more often and appear higher on the list of risks. Yeah. So again, you mentioned uh, accountants and auditors. The CPA Canada has got a group thinking about this. Uh, IIA has got people thinking about this. In uh, exploration and production operators, um, have, have you seen the implementation, successful implementation of AI projects? Uh, and then second part to that, is there a psychological benefit with management that may not be well-versed in this particular field? I would argue that it's all over the map. Uh, some people are saying, why do I need this at one end? And other people are saying, wow, this is stuff is really helping me and we've made some investments and we've made some progress. If you look at the 600 oil companies that are in the yellow pages in Calgary, only the top 25, maybe 50, have enough data and enough scale in their operation where this, this there's a net benefit here. And, you know, because you need a certain amount of organizational maturity, you need a certain level of data um, that many successful oil companies just don't have and don't need. And, and I think that's one of the reasons I put this presentation together is to be aware of that barrier and don't make assumptions about what people know and don't make the, the explanations of what you think they need to know so complicated or sophisticated or long-winded that everybody zones out and starts gripping the chair rather than building confidence, which presumably is your goal. Sitting around the boardroom of these um, large uh, oil and gas EMP companies, um, are folks that uh, their reputation is staked on the decisions that they make. And so if they make a recommendation to spend a million dollars on a project um, that ends up being a failure, well, when it comes to promotions or bonuses, um, that's what's going to be remembered. Does commodity pricing, particularly for the oil and gas and energy sector, play a role of timing of when to pitch the project? So to me, there's really three opportunities. The first one is when prices are low and in the seller, everything is focused on op cost reduction. So make sure that's what your project is all about. If, project, if, the, if the price is high, yeah, 
the whole focus has to be on how do I get more volume, production volume. So that's where you tune your that your pitch has to involve that. And the third opportunity is advancing the strategy. And that's a little tougher. And it, it has to mostly do with uh, acquisition and divestiture. So which, what assets should I be selling? And how do I know I got a reasonable price? And how do I know I didn't value, didn't understand it poorly? What is the risk of having sold something I shouldn't sell? And the reverse, what should I buy? And way too many people buy things they paid too much for. Um, that, you know, nobody, everybody doesn't want to talk about that, but that happens more often than not. And what causes that is either just wild enthusiasm, that's one issue, and the other issue is inadequate due diligence. Most companies don't have a good acquisition evaluation due diligence. So for example, well, how accurate is the, is the land estimate in the data room? How accurate is the production? How good are the reserve estimates? How good are the cost estimates? Well, it's easy for me to sit here and pontificate about this because these acquisition teams are usually under some kind of deadline. There's a date on which you have to submit a bid. Well, what better than these tools for data manipulation, data management to help you do this quickly and confidently? Now, maybe that isn't an AI ML um, application, but the other two definitely have a um, meaning volume and cost definitely have um, uh, AI aspects to them. Do you believe that our leaders are M ML AI literate enough? Um, and do you see this changing beyond just them tossing around popular buzzwords, like that they want to hire unicorns to staff an in-house uh, data team? Or do you truly believe that leaders are starting to understand what can be achieved and what risks are associated when they deploy machine learning and artificial intelligence within their organizations? I tend to believe that the first contact senior leaders have with AI ML, when there's some fiasco being described in the general media, there's something that's gone wrong and some some organization is being pummeled in the media. Issues like hiring practices and credit scoring always come up in the bad news stories. So, so that's the first exposure that a senior executive will get to AI ML. So now you come, come along with your pitch and that's the frame of mind they're in. And, and they're going, Okay, I read this headline, and now you want me to use the technology that I just read this headline about? I don't think so. So I think you have to demonstrate that you know how to avoid that fiasco that they read about. 